I guess I've been in kind of a rut lately. See, most of the directors I've covered are masters of the Hollywood film language, all those things you're not supposed to notice when you're watching a movie. The 180 degree rule to establish the geography of a scene, over the shoulder shot reverse shots for conversations. After a while, that stuff just gets ingrained in you and you stop paying attention to it. And that's probably why my last two videos have focused on plot and theme and character, not on the stuff that specifically makes film, film. I needed something to shake me up, something that would make me question all of my assumptions about the right way to do movies. Enter Yasujiro Ozu. Over a 35-year career making 50 films, Ozu honed an idiosyncratic visual style that sets his films apart not just from standard Hollywood fare, but from his Japanese contemporaries as well. He created his own film grammar, replacing the 180 degree rule with graphic matches, shooting most scenes from low angle camera positions and through doorways, and using what film scholars call pillow shots, both as a means of getting in and out of scenes and as an external signifier for his character's inner changes. But why bother? I mean, if everyone else is making movies a certain way, why put your energy into creating a whole different visual language? Ozu was pretty tight-lipped about the motivations behind his artistic choices, which leaves some viewers to assume he's doing it just to be different, but I don't think that's true. In fact, in Ozu, I see one of the most perfect examples of style and substance working hand in hand. So let's take a few minutes to explore how just one aspect of that style works with the other elements of the film in service of the story. Today on Frame 24, how Ozu's frames within a frame fashion a framework for following his films. No, seriously. All attempts at alliterative amusement aside, Ozu frequently uses the environment of a scene to create a sort of frame around the actors, or to otherwise affect our perception of the scene. We can't say for certain why he did this. He seems to have been adamantly opposed to letting anyone peek behind the curtain, but we can make some educated guesses. For starters, it's not hard to see the similarity between how Ozu frames many of his interior shots and the experience of watching a play on stage. Our horizontal view is limited by the wings, so to speak, and then vertically, we can see a portion of the floor, but not really much ceiling. Ozu also tended not to move his camera during these scenes, and to film his domestic interiors from a low angle that suggests an observer seated on the floor. All of this combines to give these shots a theatrical feel to them, even as the performances remain natural and understated. Basically, what this does is it elevates these little moments of ordinary domestic conflict. A daughter unwilling to face the prospect of marriage and adult responsibility. A son upset when the promised model train track fails to materialize. Into metaphors for the human condition. Sometimes instead of forming a frame around the action, the mise-en-scene intrudes into the shot, obscuring the subject. The Only Son tells the story of Tsune, a widowed mother who sacrifices everything for her son's education. Years later, when she visits the now-grown Ryusuke in Tokyo, Tsune discovers that his life has turned out very differently than she'd hoped. One early scene is of particular interest for our purposes here. Tsune arrives at the Tokyo station and is picked up by her son in a taxi. They make awkward small talk in the car, and Ryusuke points out various landmarks on their way to his home. But each time we cut to the outside, the image is dominated by the cab's massive fender, blocking our view of the city. Instead of a frame, we get almost the inverse here, but it serves the same function of limiting what the audience can see. Now it's tempting to brush this off as Ozu just being wacky, but the image holds a deeper meaning when understood in the context of the film's central conflict. Ryusuke's life is not at all what Tsune wanted for him. He's married, he has a son, the only job he's found is teaching night school, he's not the financial success she hoped he'd be, and she starts to feel like her sacrifice was wasted. Why isn't he trying harder to be a success? Ryusuke tries to explain to her that in Tokyo it's not that easy. 
Everybody's trying to come out on top, but there are only so many good paying jobs. Most people are struggling just to get by. She refuses to believe that. She insists he's giving up too easily. Now the meaning of that earlier image is clear. Tsune is so blinded by her vision of how things should be that she can't see Tokyo or her son's life for what it is. This is a common thread in Ozu's films. Parents often can't accept that their children face a different world than they themselves did as young adults. It's an idea that should resonate with contemporary viewers who've been chided by their elders for taking out massive student loans when I didn't need no big loans to pay for school. I went out and worked for it. You kids and your damn participate. Never mind that college is two to three times more expensive now than it was 30 years ago. The cab ride isn't the only time Ozu uses this technique in The Only Son. A number of scenes play out partially obscured by objects in the foreground. This ties back not only into Tsune's limited understanding, but sometimes suggests that Ryusuke doesn't see things clearly either. He succumbed to pessimism, unable to see a way forward. Yet by the film's end, he's determined to renew his efforts to make a better life for his family. Tsune, too, may find a new understanding. At home again, she tells her co-worker what a great man her son has become. Then she goes out back to dump her mop bucket. As she rests against the factory wall, a series of shots shows her first partially obscured by a stack of baskets, and then out in the open. Her face crumples into grief. Is this self-pity? Is it remorse? Or is she still bitter over his situation? Or maybe it's a confused swirl of all three as she tries to sort out her newfound perspective. The camera shifts its gaze to the fence which surrounds the silk factory. Now I see this as Ozu admitting that while both mother and son have gained greater awareness, that growth is imperfect. They may see clearer than before, but they can still only see so far. It's a reminder too of the limits of our own human perspective, clouded by expectations and the individual experiences that we bring to bear in interpreting the world. The last image is of the closed factory gates. Is this an invitation to move past those limitations? Or are the closed gates symbolic of a barrier that can't be crossed? In the end, the answers to these questions are less important than the wondering itself. Ozu's genius lay in his ability to use the humblest parts of life to explore the most profound. His visual aesthetic may at first glance seem like rebellion for its own sake, but a closer look suggests that every aspect of his style was, in fact, geared toward this one goal. By elevating the most mundane, maybe even universal, human experiences, Ozu encourages us to see the sacred in the profane, to use these small moments as jumping-off points for pondering the imponderables of love and death and the endless march of time. Or as the poet William Blake has it, to see a world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Hey, film dorks. I hope you enjoyed that video. I mean, holy sh** potato. Ozu, right? This was exactly the shot in the arm I needed this month. There's so much more I wanted to talk about that I just couldn't fit into one video. I mean, floating weeds, the climax of the flavor of green tea over rice. Side note, my fiance and I actually made green tea over rice for supper one night. It was pretty tasty. Do you have a favorite Yasujiro Ozu movie? Or what movie or director completely upended your concept of how filmmaking is done? Let me know down there, the comment section, not the floor. You you guys got it. I'll be back before the end of the year with some more ruminations on cinema. Until then, stay safe, happy, and well, and I'll see you on the flip side.